that we are on how's it going Woo! music theory live stream how is it going everybody i am here with uh 12 tone uh sideways and 8-bit music theory we are here to talk about um music and music theory so um how's it going everybody all down ones cool so if you guys don't know, um, these guys are part of Music Theory YouTube, which is a side of YouTube that I really didn't know would exist five years ago. Uh, it's basically a bunch of people making videos about music and music theory, how music relates to the things around us, and just our reactions to how we listen to music. And I think that's really exciting that we have that opportunity to connect with people on that level. It's something that is very exciting. And I think I just want to go uh, around with everybody and just um, let everybody introduce themselves and tell you guys what they do. Um, let's first start with uh, uh, Corey from 12 Tone. Uh, sure, so I um, I do sort of hand-drawn animations, kind of like Minute Physics or Viheart about, I don't know, whatever music theory topics I want to talk about. Um, not actually really sure how to describe my niche or anything, but uh, I guess so there was an article that was written recently, like uh, music ch uh, channel, YouTube channels that music uh, people should watch, and I was featured in it. And they said uh, Twelve Tone is a theorist first and a performer second, and that I think uh, really uh, describes sort of how I think about it. Is I focus more on that side of things, is the ideas more than applications. But yeah, that's me. Cool, awesome. Well, uh, then we also have Ethan from Sideways here. Uh, what do you do, Sideways? <laughs> I make glorified slideshow presentations on light motifs. <laughs> Next. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> glorified slideshow presentations is basically what we all do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we also have 8-bit uh, music theory. Uh, what do you do? Although that seems fairly straightforward from how, you, uh, how you've titled yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, I do uh, music theory videos, analyzing music from video games specifically. Rarely 8-bit music, uh, contrary to what you might expect, but there you go. Cool. All right. Well, now we've introduced ourselves, and now we feel good about this. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of so, fun. Thanks for showing up. We'll all see yeah, you next week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, today we're basically just going to talk about ourselves because that's what we do here on YouTube is talk about ourselves. Um, yeah. And I think the first thing, the first topic we are going to talk about is music school and basically how we got to where we are based upon our experience in music school, what we are doing in music school and how and why that might be a good thing and how it might be a bad thing and who really knows. But I think because all of us did go to music school, um, we didn't really have that idea of a YouTube career when we went there or a means of like trying to connect with people with music theory when we went there. But we just went because I think we liked music. I'm just speaking for myself. Oh, I did it for uh, the money. Yeah, the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the money with that data for the fame. Oh, yeah. The fame. Yeah. yeah. Um, so cool. Yeah. I mean, what, what was your guys experience with music school? It was rough. <laughs> All right. Like, cool. I don't know about you guys. I had a really hard time. Um, like literally from day one, from the audition, all the way till about like my last year, it was just constant of like, oh, let's completely redefine how I like listen to the radio. And oh, there are birds chirping. And all of a sudden there's intervals. Like <laughs> everything about life started changing. Oh, okay. So, but that was a rough thing. Normally that seems like some revelation for some people to be like, hey, I can listen to the door squeak and it's an A flat to an E flat. Right, but <laughs> for me, I walked in with a very specific preconceived notion of like what I thought was good and what I thought I wanted to do. And I walked out the other end like a completely different person. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah, that's that's really for interesting. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that was like... Um, I mean, it sounds like you had like that was a bad thing almost for you, or like was that just was, a, a an it, event that happened because of it? It was dramatic, is what okay. I could say. It was okay. like really intense. It's not like if I had to describe music school, it's not something you can like coast through. You know, it's gonna demand a lot from you. Gotcha. I mean, I definitely know some people who have coasted through music school, and um, they're not really doing music anymore. And it's the people who I feel like who have had that dramatic experience that actually get to do really cool and amazing things. If you like 
you know, if you get out of it, that ability to listen to music differently. Um, that certainly was, was it for me is like, I went in being an awesome bass player, or at least I thought so for like a high schooler, I was like, I'm going to be an amazing bass player. And I left, I left school barely playing bass because I was so involved in like other different things that I found interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think that's usually the case is like, if you go in with an agenda, it's always gonna, it's always gonna radically change if you're open to it. But absolutely. Um, how are your, how was, uh, your experience, uh, 12 tone? I mean, kind of similar to what you described as sort of, you know, I, I joked that I went for the fame, but literally like when I was coming from high school, I was like, I'm going to go to college for a couple of years and then become a famous metal singer. I'm going to be the next Rob Zombie. This will be easy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that is not what happened. Uh, so sort of if you show up at music school with those sorts of dreams and your teachers are any good, one of the first things they're going to do is explain to you how statistics work. <laughs> uh, but so like I got there, and I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Cause I'm here. And I sort of, that, that was sort of where I got into theory and I got into the idea of teaching. Uh, and in terms of just my general experience, I, I went to one of those like for-profit trade schools. I don't, really want to mention the name because I'm not sure that I feel comfortable recommending them at this point. Not because they're not, not because I didn't have a good experience, but because, you know, it's expensive and those sorts of things are not necessarily designed to be super. I mean, I learned a lot, but it's sort of, it's set up so that you can get through without learning a lot if you want to. And I just, I'm not sure that I would recommend that taking on that level of student debt uh, that a lot of my friends did. But, mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was, I, like I said, I got a lot out of it. It sort of really changed the way I look at the world and the way I look at art and the way I look at music. And I think that that was sort of, I don't know, where I fell in love with theory it was just this like, class where I had always been good at math. And I take this class where it's like, here is math that you can turn into art. And yeah, yeah, yeah that's, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so. I, guess, I guess that brings up the question is like, is, is music school worth it? I mean, um, you said you went to a for-profit for institution. Yeah. Um, I went to uh, a, a private institution that costs a lot of money. Yeah. Um, there are ways of going to music school without spending a ridiculous amount of money. But you know, is it is it worth it uh, for being in debt for the rest of your life? Or uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's a I, I, yeah. question. But yeah, <laughs> I think, yeah, it's a complicated question. It sort of depends on your values. It's not. It's not likely to pay for itself very effectively in terms of, you know, like for like resources. You're not likely to make that money back particularly fast with the degree. Yep. But if, whether or not that is how you want to define worth is a different question, I guess is the best I can answer that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's great. Like um, you're not going to school to get a, a business degree. You're going to school to get a music degree. And, yeah. you know, if you wanted to make money, don't go. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Yeah, people like I often get questions like, "Hey, twelve tone, would you recommend becoming a music theorist?" Because it seems really cool. And I was like, "Well, that depends how you feel about money." It's just, do yeah. you like have a get? Because probably not. But <laughs> well, I mean, it's you have to like one thing singularly enough that that is your life for them yep. from then on, at least for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, in order for it to be worth it, because then it will be worth it, because then yeah. there's no other option besides to do it. Yeah. You have to be that sort of single minded about it. Um, I think I think that's a really, really great point is that if you get some sort of like business degree or even a STEM degree, there's a lot of flexibility there. Like sure. I knew I knew physics majors who worked on oil rigs, which you don't think of connecting those dots. But if you get a music degree, it's not going to translate into basically anything else. Um, I know I know some local programs who are accepting people to their PhD musicology program straight out of their bachelors because nobody just wants to have a master's degree in musicology. Everybody's kind of go, got to go straight to PhD and on their website, they're like, if you get a PhD in musicology, you can teach or maybe be a music librarian. And that's it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's great. Although I feel like there is a, a space that's opening up. I mean, in terms of what our career is, which yeah. is, music theory, YouTube person, personality, I guess, yeah. would a, you know, a PhD in musicology would be pretty useful for this particular uh, means of communicating ideas, I think, anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the traditional system, yeah, there is no, no reason to go into academic music beyond even a bachelor's degree. But I mean, people want to connect with some ideas. And if you're good at communicating them, in theory, if you have a PhD in musicology, you'll have a, a good understanding of 
of musicology, what music is, uh, cult on a cultural level. So maybe that, I don't know. I'm just, no, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, eight bit music theory. What was your, uh, experience with, um, music education in the higher level? Um, kind of a lot of what, uh, you guys are all saying, like, um, what you were saying before, Adam, of, of being the best bassist in your high school or whatever, and then going to university, I totally had the same experience of like, you know, being in Provoner bands and stuff and being such a hotshot 17 year old drummer and then uh, showing up at university and all of a sudden you go straight from competing against high school drummers to competing against every drummer uh, on planet earth, basically. So it was kind of a rough uh, <laughs> transition in that sense, but well, it's good for, you, um, for your ego, though, because I mean it's bad for your yeah. ego, but it's good for your, your soul <laughs> because definitely, you now know you are definitely. not the best ever, and now you have to stand for something. You have to stand yeah, for, for sure. what it is you do, and that's and that's you have to mean. find some original voice beyond like, oh yeah, I do what my band teacher tells me to the best of anyone, you know. <laughs> so yeah, and. It's a it's a rough thing for any kind of mu musician or just really anybody to be in a space where you're you're the big fish in the small pond and then you are nobody. Um, Absolutely, that's that's really interesting. You guys bring that up because I had the exact opposite experience. Oh, um, all right. Tell I me. I didn't graduate high school. I technically dropped out, and I had only ever seen a bassoon once before I went to college, and I don't think I'd ever seen an oboe in real life. So uh, when I got to my audition, I couldn't completely read bass clef. And by the time I was in my music theory one class, I actually discovered that the circle of fifths like was a thing and existed. <laughs> so I came from like a really, really small background. And then when I went to college, I was like immediately outclassed by everybody surrounding me. That is a fairly common experience. I feel like though, like, oh, yeah. um, and you know, it then is like a testament to like your ability then to like, all right, well, I'm like, you know, you were able to like master what it is that you did, even though you felt like outclassed by everybody or like, do you think that it was because like, uh, just a burning desire to learn about everything around you or no, it like was, a, a, comp a competitive desire? No, it was honestly, like, it was people like you guys, like you guys had like these high school band, like backgrounds and stuff. And it'd be people like you who would help me out. They're like, Hey guys. I have no idea what an alto clef is. Can one of you help me? <laughs> <laughs> well, in case anybody wants to know what an alto clef is, yeah. uh, <laughs> there's one right here. <laughs> yeah. Movable clefs. No, it was really, third so like, clef. so what was, I guess that's kind of like interesting from my perspective. Cause when I saw people like you guys who had like this really, really strong background, it was kind of like an inspiration. What did you guys think when you saw like the senior performance majors who could just like shred a tonal stuff that, you might not have seen before. Uh, well, that was very humbling. I remember the first time I saw somebody who was like that. There was a guitar player. I forget his name, but he was able to do like the crazy atonal shred. Um, I guess in the style like like Alan Holdsworth, but just like as a like you know twenty year old jazz guitarist. And I, I thought like I am I am nothing. Like is this what I'm <laughs> supposed to do by like in, next year? Like. Mm -hmm. Jeez, I, I just learned how to play a Dorian scale over a vamp, and that sounds incredible. And I think yeah. that I'm awesome, just like sequencing it in thirds. And I'm like, this is this is cool. Check me out. And then I hear this, and then you know, it, there was a lot of these experiences where I felt like uh, my worth was less because of somebody else's ability. And that is a very toxic thing that a lot of people end up like falling into. You see what other people are doing, and I, I still do this. I see other people's channels. I see your guys' channels. I'm like damn, I got to step it up. Um, <laughs> like I see that all the time because you always compare your worth to somebody else and music. Oh, it's yeah, definitely, sure. it's definitely like that because everybody lauds you. You say like, Oh, that's amazing. You sound incredible or you're such a good drummer or bass player or guitarist or whatever. And then you come up across, you have to look that gets lost when you see somebody else better than you, because then you feel like they're more deserving of how you've been feeling about yourself absolutely music, I mean, that, yeah. that happened like so i was in in high school i was learning bass i was starting to play bass as well because i was like ah, i don't want to just be a singer i want an instrument too and so i was i was getting decent and then i show up at college and i see the people in the bass program and i'm like nah, never mind this is 
this is not happening. I mean, I think we've all experienced like looking at the audition results on a board somewhere and just feeling crushed, you know, and immediately you're like, I'm not as good as that person. That dude's the king. Yeah. Crap. What do I do now? Yeah, it was really interesting, though, uh, for me, at least maybe it's just because I went to a small school, small Canadian school. Um, so I'm not in massive debt. Ha ha. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you would, yeah, you'd have the people a couple years ahead of you who would just destroy you in every way musically, and you could see that and feel bad about yourself and and be motivated if you uh, had the character to be motivated by that. But then you could also go through to the practice rooms and see like, oh, this guy that just crushed me uh, in auditions is yeah. practicing here yeah. every night for hours mm -hmm. and hours and hours, and it's like, okay, well, how can I expect to get the same results without the same work? You know, absolutely. For sure. Um, I mean, it, it's just a, the music school experience is definitely, I think, a microcosm for what music is like in the real world in some way. It's just like it's been condensed into like a bunch of people getting into this, yeah. uh, the same sort of thing. So you learn the right habits. And even if you might learn the like material elsewhere in terms of what the music theory is, what the scales are, what everything else is, it's just being in that environment, at least for me. This is, yeah, same. I, can only, I can only speak for my own my own self, but I think being in that environment is what's valuable about it. And I, I, before I went to music school, I was like, um, I was super into forums, like just talking about bass and stuff on forums. And one of the things that a lot of people would recommend is like, you don't need to go to music, uh, music school. You just need to get a good teacher and like study a bunch. And it's the same amount, it's the same thing. If you just get a bunch of good private teachers and study a lot, you'll get the same education. I've never met anybody who actually went and did that, even though that was the advice that was super prevalent back then is like, you don't need music school, just get, you know, private teachers and they will charge you a lot less. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a lot to be said just sort of for, I think the idea of like being in an environment where all of your friends, like, no music at a level at the same sort of level they think about it a lot and you have like conversations and like when you learn something cool you can go to like your best friend and be like hey my teacher just showed me diminished seventh modulations that's awesome and they'll be like wow that is that is awesome instead of like if i go to like my friends from high school they'll be like what are the words you're saying mm -hmm. so just sort of having yeah. having that environment where you're you're not alone or uh, like you're just surrounded every day like naturally and without particular effort on your part with people who want to think about music at the same level that you do mm -hmm. is i think really really valuable and really useful in terms of growing as a musician for sure yeah, yeah. um okay well i think right now this is probably a fate worse than death but i'm gonna look over to the the chat to see what people are saying if there's Sweet. any any good questions and if there are any good questions that you guys see feel free to go and check it out. Um, I saw some questions about online music schools. That's um, interesting. Yeah, I think I, I honestly, since I've never actually reviewed any of the material on an online music school, I can't really say a lot about what their value is. I know there are plenty of people who have like courses that they sell and all that's that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, what about you guys? Do you have any thoughts on online music schools? Um, I think one of the really big important parts of going to a music school is being on stage and a lot of the practical things that you learn. Like there is a lot of stuff that's on paper that shows up, but um, actually I just watched one of your videos, Adam, where you were talking about uh, the books that you like and yeah. how learning music is kind of like learning a language. And as much as you can learn music from a book in the end of the day, you need to see a native speaker in order to get your accent right. Um, so if you do an online school, I would say make sure that they have a lot of Skype conversations and like as much as you can, like talking to someone face to face as opposed to, Oh, Hey, we have 18 courses just on medieval counterpoint or something. Yeah. yeah I think that's very important. Um, just being able to interact with another person. Like, and mm -hmm. it's interesting that you say, you know, knowing how a native speaker actually sounds and with music, that can be a little bit tricky online unless you have an amazing connection and zero latency because there's no there's never going to be any interaction in real time with another person's you know time feel or just like matching intonation yeah. like there's all these subtleties that just don't exist if you're not in the same room as another person 
Uh, well, yeah. So, so like um, <laughs> when I was playing piano and taking piano lessons, one of the biggest problems I had was I had a bunch of tension in my shoulders, like in my forearms and my shoulders and just in the way I sat and on the bench. And it's like, if you don't have like a human sitting in the room with you, like able to look at what your body is doing week after week after week, that kind of problem might never get like noticed and it'll never get solved. And that can cause a lot of problems down the line. For sure. Like technique, especially mm -hmm. just, there's no substitute yeah. for actually just being in the room with somebody else. Um, yeah. So, uh, let's see a bunch of people asking for the lick, of course. <laughs> because, oh, Adam, what's that? Because you show it's us the us internet. <laughs> buy my t-shirt. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but do buy the t-shirt. Yeah, totally buy the t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, we have a request for talking about microtones. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, nice. Are we gonna are we gonna go do this right now? Or sure. Uh, it's it's like so. The whole point of a microtone is like you take F and F sharp. It's the note in between those notes. Great. So we covered it. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this That's is just play normal notes, but they're really small. It's, yeah. They're, they're tiny tiny notes. <laughs> mini uh, notes. Yeah. I think for a regular course. note, I'll make it smaller. That's a yeah. that's microtones. Um, that is of course an obsession that I've had over the Same. past like year. What and started that for you? The the 12 tone thing or the 12 tone thing. Uh, I was um, more than 12 tone thing. Yeah. I don't really know. Uh, it was kind of just getting into pitch frequency ratios. Like, you know, major third is five to four and uh, like major, major ninth yeah, is nine to eight and just getting more into that and then realizing, oh, like our 12 tone equal tempered system is so different. Work. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, yeah it, learning about it the works. history of like temperament for me was a big part of that. Sorry, but learning temperament. about the history of temperament and sort of oh, looking yeah. at like that that same sort of like the harmonic series and translating from there is a like big part of how I got into like that. that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just a it's a whole like it's a whole community too, like the Zen mm -hmm. harmonic community. I I want to talk about it more, but I just don't understand it enough. So it's, it's really good. dense. There's yeah. a lot of math. It's super dense and it's stuff that you don't actually learn in music school or you don't really, there's not a lot of like text describing it um, mm -hmm. because there's just not a lot of application for like microtonal stuff. It's most of it sounds very strange and very weird when you just like take, you know, take 24 notes, like just divide the uh, keyboard and like find all the notes in between and you just start playing. It kind of sounds bad, <laughs> at least yeah. to me. Um, so, and I can't, you know, there's this one guitarist. Um, he teaches at Berkeley. I'm not going to say his name, but uh, he kind of just did that. He just found a microtonal guitar and started playing. And I just cannot stand when people end up doing that because it just kind of sounds bad. It like all and sounds out of tune. Yeah. I, I, man, I try so hard. I try so hard to expand my ears, but there are ways of making it sound really amazing. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, my, yeah so, um, I had a theory sorry. professor in college who wrote his dissertation on uh, Henry Parch. I Harry think, Parch. Harry Parch. Harry Parch. Yeah, you did a video on him. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, there was a period of time where I talked to that professor who also was the professor who did the clock diagram thing. And he was cool. like, oh, yeah, no. So here's like a 32 uh, note per octave marimba. And like we see all these videos about it and stuff. I was like, this is insane. How do you come up with this? Uh, probably 31 note because there are three kinds of there's uh, 12, 19 and 31, which approximate the perfect fifth, the best. So anyway, yeah. I'm I, I don't know right now. <laughs> I'm <nerding laughs> yeah. <at all>. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, thoughts. Uh, okay, let's find find a non microtonal thing. Non microtonal Aww. question. How how to turn a beat into a song? Okay, that's kind of an interesting one, just in terms of like composition. Yeah. Like a lot of people talk about, you know, like in modern digital audio workstations, there's the idea of creating a loop and then just mm -hmm. adding to the loop. How do you actually think compositionally if you're just starting out with a and like turning a beat into an actual song? You guys have any I mean, I do. I do a lot of. I, I do some like additive loop composition these days. That's sort of a, a, what I've been doing recently in terms of composing. So, like, sort of what I what I'll do is I'll start with something like really simple that has a lot of space, and then sort of look like one at a time for writing like a different part that has sort of that fills some of that space, and that sort of I, I think often or follows the same rhythm. That that can be um, another approach to that is just just looking for things that. Um, what am I trying to say? Either sort of flow with that beat or fill interesting gaps in it is I think a large part of how I think about that. Uh, uh, that'd be my starter advice. Anyway, it looked like 8-Bit was going to say something, so sorry for interrupting. But Oh, no, no. I was just going to say it depends, for me at least, um, like on the genre that you're trying to fit inside when you're writing, I guess. 
because there, I mean, there's a lot of music that's based on loops or has incorporates loops and beats that just repeat. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry guys. Yeah, for me, when it comes to um, writing music, I found that I can get really easily distracted by the tool that I'm using. So I, I, I can immediately tell the difference between the stuff that I wrote looking at like FL Studio or Ableton, as opposed to the stuff that I write sitting at the piano, because like I play a lot of piano or played a lot yeah. of the piano. Um, so if you're like writing a loop and you can't get something to sound right, you can't get something to sound good, try not using Ableton, like put on headphones, have the beat playing in your head, then get a microphone and record yourself singing the melody in your head and try and get the melody from your head into the computer instead of writing a melody in the computer and putting that into your head. It'll end up sounding more organic instead of trying to like trick your brain into writing something that you're convincing yourself sounds better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, this is something that's come up a bunch of times. Like the means of writing a piece of music ends up influencing the music in a very yeah. big way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could also, one of the things, one of the tricks I would say is start using music notation software instead of a, instead of like Ableton or whatever, because yeah. then immediately your like your frame of reference is completely different because you can't just copy paste. I mean, I guess you could copy paste four bar sections, but it's not yeah. set up to be a four bar section that just loops and loops and loops. You just have this like canvas and what people then just start doing is just start dragging like notes on the canvas. And so it ends up being a very different sort of form rather than these four bar loops. There's these much more like free flowing sort of organic sorts of sections. Now there's tons of problems with using music notation software to write, but I think that it's just an interesting thing of using the tools to create a very different, you know, approach to music yeah. making. Um, rather than, you know, then that you could also just sit down at the piano and start noodling around. But, um, you know, if you have these tools, my, why not use them? Um, yeah, like, like I'm a piano player. So sitting down and playing the piano, like, isn't that hard for me. But like, if you're a guitarist, use a guitar. If you're a flute player, use a flute, you know, like whatever is easier for you. I mean, if yeah. you're starting out, I don't know if you're like more experienced. Yeah. Uh, I would, sorry, I would, I would just um, echo what uh, Ethan was saying in terms of just like, if it's a loop, it's supposed to be looped. So loop it and listen to it over and over again and see what happens in your head. See mm -hmm. where your mind goes and what feels like it's missing and what feels like it, what it feels like it wants. But yeah, cool. Um, so another question. Uh, talk about how modal music doesn't exist, please. <laughs> <laughs> Is this some Gaku concept? <laughs> Uh, I, I guess I didn't see the video. Uh, uh, I just saw it, and then so okay. So did did anybody see the video? I, I mean, I, I just saw the the. I didn't click on it, but no, I haven't. I've I've seen yeah. some videos by him, and I see him on Twitter a lot. He's like, "Modal music doesn't exist, and this is why." And I don't completely understand it. I mean, but it's, it's, it seems like kind of playing with definitions more than talking about any real. You know, yeah. music theory idea and part of what we do is playing with definitions for the sake of oh, yeah. like making it easier to understand but i don't <laughs> i don't sure. yeah, would, would have to hear the yeah. argument to okay. really but if there's one thing i hated about music it's definitions and how like definitions change over time and can meet mul multiple things like a yeah. light motif doesn't have to be an actual motif like god damn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean okay so for for you lord of the light motif sideways <laughs> I am uh, the almighty Lord. yeah <laughs> if somebody told you that light motifs didn't exist how would you <laughs> how would you approach that that depends is there a baseball bat adjacent to wherever i am <laughs> um so i mean you you talk about the use of light motif in film uh -huh. and other things all the time yeah um how did you become that lord of the light motif how did that become part of your brand i made your one educational? video talking about pixar and it got real big and people were like oh my god this is amazing and i'm like no it's not it's a light motif and then i made more videos just like hey guys this movie does it oh and this video game does it and it's kind of like a cool thing you can do in movies and people like what <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what happened there that's amazing yeah, uh, it, it, that's, that's all it is. <laughs> so you, you really just took that Pixar movie and you literally just, all right, this is part of my brand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. Oh, yeah. Move with the flow, right? Success <laughs> is just failing in the right direction. That's great. <laughs> uh, do you guys feel like, okay, so what is everybody? So yours is the Pixar movie, which it is, is like our Pixar one. It's like 3 million views. It's insane. 2.7. Okay. 
Oh my God. That's, that's awesome. What are, what is, yeah. so what is everybody's best performing video? And do you like the fact that it's your best performing video? <laughs> uh, for a long time, mine was what makes Mario music sound fun, which I kind of, uh, expected in a way where, or not expected, but I hoped I was like, Mario is like the most broadly appealing video game character. You know, this seems like something people would click on. But then after a while, um, uh, my one, I have a video analyzing a sax solo from a Mario Kart track in great Dolphin detail. Uh, Dolphin Souls? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I did not, that one seems way too esoteric to be my best performing video, but I think it is now. That's, that's great. Um, do you feel like proud of it or do you feel like it just got it's just like a video like um i mean obviously we were very pr prideful of everything that we are in theory um <laughs> but is that do you feel like you wanted that video to be the best performing video is that one like that you're most proud of uh i don't know that's a really good question i guess it's not that i like i didn't want it to be more successful than other videos or anything i was just like oh this is well the th actually it was something that completely sidetracked me i was working on another video and then i thought of doing this one and went oh and just made it super quick so maybe that just like the fact that i found it interesting uh i'm glad that other people also found it interesting because that means mm -hmm. i'm not totally crazy you know <laughs> yeah that's awesome uh, yeah. Corey, what about you? Yeah, so I think uh, my most uh, most successful one right now is the comfortably numb analysis. Although I think Africa is gaining on it. All right, but uh, yeah. it's just it doesn't surprise me at all. You know, my audience is rock music nerds, and comfortably numb is by Pink Floyd. So uh, <laughs> it's it just it fits. It also wound up, I think, on Guitar Pro's uh, page for how to play comfortably numb. If someone posted it there. Just like here's here's a video analyzing the thing, so I get like a steady flow of things from that. Uh, but like I'd, like I said, it's mostly if you look at like my top performing videos, they're like all the analysis videos. It's like I think my top ten are all that, and just like I keep making these non-analysis videos and be like, no, eventually I will get people to care about microtonality as much as they care about Pink Floyd. I'm and in the it, exact same situation. It hasn't worked. <laughs> it has not, <laughs> not happened yet. <laughs> I think the the goal with some some of it because you do go, you go really far in the weeds, but people do do watch watch the videos, yeah. which is awesome. I think for me sometimes the goal is to try and like sneak in the intense stuff oh, yeah. in the like less you know the clickbaity titles. Yeah, uh, for sure. That's something you know I, I love trying to do is like give people the give people that stuff what, even though they clicked for a different reason. You trick them uh, into learning. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. show them. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely a big big thing the analysis videos do is they sort of give me this like boost in the algorithm that says oh people like watching 12 tone videos and i'm like surprise <laughs> it's like <laughs> i don't even know like 12 no, not all yeah, interval whatever. 12 tone sets or something is <laughs> deal um, with it we have a super chat um I, I thought i turned them off unfortunately all right well i get guess paid have, yeah they paid um <laughs> hey guys love your channels would love to hear you guys talk about the music from my land samba what do you guys know about Brazilian music and samba? If any, it's not fun to play. Hmm. It's very fun to play. Doom, da -goom, da -goom, da -goom. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know a whole lot to be honest, but I do. Yeah. Uh, I do. What's it? The cavaquinho, the little like ukulele thing. That's always fun, and like that surdo rhythm. Da -da -goom, da -da -goom. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all, all kinds of like little things. I mean, there's definitely like a bastard bastardized version that like uh, American musicians will play, especially American like jazz musicians. So I, I always feel embarrassed talking about it because it's not it's not the real stuff. No, yeah. totally. I'm the exact same way. I, I yeah. only know a little bit about uh, like all I know about samba is like jazz samba, you know, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. the jazz samba, which is god terrible but amazing but great <laughs> um, the i guess the the prime example is like uh 500 miles high by chick Corea has like oh, a god, samba I had to sing that once as an ensemble i had to sing that song it was like oh, yeah. first quarter of the bachelor program 
because they just they use the same songs for all the levels and they just did like one booklet per um quarter and so like first or second quarter they were like "Ah, everyone has to do 500 miles high and i i could not sing 500 miles high such a strange song to be like (laughs) this is a standard Um, (laughs) and academic music does that too is like it's they say this is the standard for which you are going to learn music Mm -hmm. Uh, and for some reason that song this like kind of b-side type chick korea Mm -hmm. song from light as a feather uh became that there's a couple other ones but um anyway it is fire according to the chat 500 miles is fire um another question uh, theory for granular music. Do you guys know anything about gran- granular music? The um, granular synthesis? Granular synthesis, I think. I don't really know a whole lot about it besides the one granular delay in Ableton Live. But yeah, that's, yeah. If you guys know anything, I don't know, yeah. I know what I do. It's, yeah, that's, that's outside of my area. Cool. Unfortunately. Sorry. I love, helpful answer, but... <laughs> I love when people say things and I feel like, I yeah, talk authoritatively about it, and I know nothing. Yeah. It's really nice when it happens in comments because I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna go spend a week researching that and make a video." That's how half but, my videos happen. You know, yeah, Absolutely that's like I, I remember once, like someone like years ago was like, "You should make a video on neo Riemannian theory," and I was like, "I don't know what that means, but I'm gonna go read a bunch," and it's it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I I have no idea about granular music. It's not anything that I know anything about. <laughs> Well, that's, yeah. And that and it's, says a lot to like how much research, you know, is required for any of these videos because, you know, before starting YouTube, I would, I, I didn't spend much time researching things in terms of like going through scientific journals or going and reading books and stuff. And then of course, as soon as I start YouTube, you kind of have to be right about what it is that you say. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, I, I don't mean that like flippantly. I mean, I, I yeah. want to say truth, truthful things whenever I yeah. make a video. Um, and it requires a lot to just like double check exactly what you're saying and making sure that, you know, yeah. it's not wrong. And I've gotten things wrong a bunch of times. And it's like, mm. it's kind of yeah. like bad. Like, I, I don't like doing that. Yeah. Just even no, from precision, a precision is the name of the game there. Absolutely. Because like, <sighs> yeah, like yeah. A, a single typo and like half your comment section is gone. Right. Yeah. You, like, you misquote something and like the whole video is just done. Yeah. Yeah. I got um, Mozart's name wrong in a video recently, and yeah, oh, I remember that. Is it, it was kind of a mess in the comments, <laughs> but you know, fair enough. I I made the mistake. I just I confused him with Beethoven and said Ludwig instead of Wolfgang. But uh, <laughs> they all have like twelve <laughs> names anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, just, yeah I'm a Mozart different. had like um, <laughs> but um, Ludwig. Oh my God, this, this is too many super chats. Oh, I, I just got like right. six questions. Yeah. Okay. This this is a little ridiculous. I should have turned this off. <laughs> um, but we have to do it and okay. Uh, <laughs> Hey guys, what, what do you think the next breakthrough in music theory is? Okay. Is there a break breakthrough in music theory? Does that thing happen in music theory? <laughs> it's well, partly you know, because it models like musical cultures. I think that the breakthroughs happen when the musical culture changes. Like I think that the breakthroughs in terms of analyzing like hip hop and rap music, because that's a, in a lot of ways fundamentally different from a lot of the music that came before it. But yeah. it's not so much music theory discovering these ideas as it is musicians discovering these ideas and then us coming along and being like, wait, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm glad you brought up like the rap hip hop thing. Like, you know, there's no, not a lot of serious like discussion yeah. on a music theory level of that. And part of it, the reason is because so few music theorists yours truly included or have any degree of familiarity with the genre or like anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of like decoding flow, like how you actually approach like rapping in terms of like the rhythmic structure and how it relates to the music. And there are people doing that, but I feel like not enough. So I think that's a big, that's the next big thing um, for sure. And it changes so quickly too. So like what's popular now is going to be decoded and analyzed 20 years from now. Yeah, Absolutely. that's usually how it works. So the the thing I always heard is that it's the it's the composer's responsibility to challenge the norm, and then it's the theorist's responsibility to understand what happened. Yeah, like the music yeah. always comes first, for sure. Yeah, and it's um, also worth remembering just everything was contemporary once. So yeah. like we're now at a point where we know what Beethoven was doing because you know he we've had a long long time to look at his stuff, but. Mm-hmm. 
at the time he was revolutionary. He was doing stuff that people weren't really prepared for. Yeah, the premiere of the Rite of Spring started a riot, you know? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. According to uh, all of the many articles that you'll read read about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to get through through these to make sure that we get to all of them. Oh. Um, hey, I'm a fan of all, you all. Um, as a fan of the YouTube community, I wonder uh, who you looked up to as growing musicians, older YouTubers, teachers, speakers, Leonard Bernstein, etc. Uh, Leonard Bernstein, for sure. For me, uh, Victor Wooten, the bass player, is definitely a oh, huge yeah. influence on me. Uh, what about you guys? I mean, a lot of them. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ethan. You you go. I have... Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> without question, Obu Uematsu yeah. in the Final Fantasies. Awesome. Yeah. That was like that was it in uh in high school. That and like Martin O'Donnell with Halo. Um, a lot of video game stuff, and then obviously John Williams. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, what about you guys? Um, so like, I mean, a lot of the musicians that I sort of looked up to when I sort of went to music school and those sorts of things were more on the metal and rock side of things than like, yeah. you know, classical or anything. So it's like, like I said, I wanted to be the next Rob Zombie. Also, like I loved like Marilyn Manson. I also um, had a huge fan, still am, of Jethro Tull. Uh, Ian Anderson is like amazing. Uh Jackson Brown is again slightly different, still rock, but different kind of rock than Rob Zombie. But like th those were probably like my the biggest people that I really like looked up to and wanted to sort of be like when I was studying. And I did did a lot of their songs in like my like juries and stuff. I actually did a Rob Zombie song in my senior uh, recital. Oh, dude, yeah. really? that's awesome! Yeah. yeah, fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, eight bit. Any, any. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, most of my heroes growing up were drummers because I was a drummer and thought of myself as like a drummer, you know. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I was big into prog rock, big into Neil Peart and Mike Portnoy, and every twelve-year-old drummer loves those guys. So that's probably no <laughs> surprise. But that's awesome. uh, and then yeah, I get into like Art Blakey was a huge influence on me as a, a player and stuff too. Um, but then, yeah, like I always loved video game music, especially the stuff I grew up with, GameCube era, like Wind Waker, Chibi Robo, Nintendo music. And, uh, and uh, I really wasn't a big uh, like theory person. Like I remember uh, in my first year of university, halfway through, someone said the word diatonic in conversation. I was just like, what does diatonic mean? Yep. So it, just has it wasn't time. until... Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't until recently that I sort of, uh, yeah, started figuring that stuff out. But as far as the theory side goes, this book, uh, Songwriting Secrets of the Beatles by Dominic Pedler, definitely informed my approach to analyzing music. Most, I also love the Beatles and, and the Beach Boys and, and that era of yeah. music, too. So. Awesome. Have you guys done Beach Boys analyses yet? No, I keep meaning to. I have some on my list, but I just haven't got around to it yet. That man, that's something that I got to do because yeah. some of that stuff just from even from a production level is just like pretty in incredible. Yeah. But anyway, I love, I love Beach Boys. Love them. I've been kicking myself for shoehorning my channel into a place where I can't really <laughs> talk about the Beach Boys. <laughs> no, just do it. Just go for it. Yeah, just yeah. do it. I promise you, nobody will care. And <laughs> I mean, maybe they will. But it's like they could obscure game and claim that they use the Beach Boys as a soundtrack. Yeah, they yeah. Do double check. Like, or just like clickbait them into thinking that it's a thing about a game and then just do it. <laughs> <Yeah. out. laughs> just how the Beach Boys influenced Mario and then start with they didn't really, but here's some talk about the Beach Boys. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, you go. Nice. Uh, okay. Just keep keep it going. All right. Yeah. Four four with triplet swing or twelve eight. What is the proper way to write and what do you prefer reading? So that's an oddly specific question question to to answer but um you know like in a sort of like 12 8 groove deca da deca da deca da deca da how would you notate that would you wrote, notate it in 4 4 with triplets or would you notate it in 12 8 i prefer 12 8 i uh, sort of honestly part of this goes back to something my old arranging teacher told me uh where he was saying like you know a old school like arrangers uh, got often paid by the page so you use like 12 8 <laughs> because it's longer yeah, but uh, but obviously uh, I've, I've never been paid for that. But just like, 
they, 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 I just I think that it sort of lays out better to not have to write threes everywhere. That's and, true. Yeah. You know, if you're doing like just like a swing thing or just like with without that middle triplet ever, then sure, you just just write like the eighth notes equals the triplet thing. You you know how to write that, and then like that's then you just do the thing normally. But if you're trying to get all three, then it's just a lot easier to not have a million like threes written all over your page, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, there's like tunes like Stevie Wonder's Isn't She Lovely, which is like doesn't really ever have that middle three, but there's yeah. like it's definitely a triplet feel. I mean, like there's decada da, decada, da, but yeah. Um, yeah. There's another tune. I was just actually doing an arrangement of it. Do you know, does anybody here know Carly Rae Jepsen's Run Away With Me? Yes. No. Yes. I mean, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure. There's only things that yeah. you enjoy authentically. For okay, me. so where's the guilt Absolutely. coming from then? Uh, just, <laughs> no, it's it's an amazing song. Right. But I, I just had to like come up with this, like, do I write in 4-4 or do I write in 12-8? And 12 eight's the right way. Uh, it's like, even though there's a lot more stuff on the page for me, it's 12-8. So yeah. Anyway. Um, okay, more, more questions. In college, my comp teacher stated that writing should mostly come from the inner ear. Knowing that the medium affects your writing, should there be much emphasis on writing as abstractly as possible? So this is the whole idea of like, should you just pre-hear everything and then write it down? Or should you like use the computer or use the piano or whatever? I think I we were think talking about this earlier. It depends on what you want, mostly. Like like we were talking about earlier, like it, it affects how you write and affects what you write. But it doesn't, there's no necessarily, there's not necessarily a value judgment associated with that. So yeah. like if you're writing, if you're hired to write for a movie or something and they're like, oh, I really want 50s uh you know uh what's that called like doo-wop Do <clears throat> you know maybe don't rely so much on your inner ear as like just like figuring out what the specific things that make 50s doo-wop sound like 50s doo-wop are and then mining that uh gold mine you know yeah. yeah yeah i mean i generally think that there's often like a stigma attached to using tools in art which seems weird to me like there's just you know this idea that you know, real art comes from within. And it's like, I yes, I have to create all the things, but I have these things that make that easier. And just like, you know, you can sit down at a piano and play things there and figure out stuff that way. I And I think that that's, it's helpful. It, uh, and if it makes your composition process easier and you like the results, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. It totally depends on like uh, what you're, where you are and what you're doing. But to kind of come back to the question, um, when I was in the comp studio, my professor told me that he emphasized students using their inner ear to compose as opposed to a tool because a lot of incoming freshmen would just rely on sitting in front of the computer or sitting in front of their instrument and they would never like, in, like visualize the music in their head. And if you never get to that point, then that can really kind of hamstring you. So yeah. it might be your professor trying to pull something out of you that you haven't shown them yet. I think that's an important point is like a lot of the piece of it, pieces of advice that we get are not meant to be like universal. Like this is what everybody should do all the time and is what everybody does all the time. It's mainly like a teaching tool to get you to think in a different way. Right. Because I don't, I don't pre hear everything that I, I write. And most of the time when I pre hear something, it's like just a general gesture. Like, okay, I'm want like, you know, a blah here. And then you just think of like, okay, what does that blah actually mean? And then you can work it out like in a compositional like program and like hear the different versions of what blah means. But it's just thinking about music in a different way so that you're not completely beholden to just the tool giving you that initial inspiration. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people in music school, that's kind of necessary because you have all these tools, the digital audio workstation, whatever. Uh, that make making music so easy and that's so great, but there's another side to it besides just letting the computer dictate what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And to draw an analogy, it kind of reminds me of like uh, parallel fifths is like, you have to learn not to do parallel fifths. You have to learn to write music that oh, you don't have to, I'm not, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do, but there's a reason that your music theory teacher will like yell at you for using perfect fifth or not yell, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe you. Know, I don't know. Yeah, it, it depends. But uh, like, but the the reason they'll like criticize you and mark you down for using writing parallel fits, and that's not because 
they're inherently evil or they're inherently bad, but it's because you're trying to learn how to think about harmony and melodies in a specific way and voice leading and just having that learning how to not do that is valuable, even if that's not necessarily what you're going to do in your music when you actually make your own music. Yeah, I, I think that's a big part of it because the perfect fifth thing when I first was like studying it and when first yeah. person said like, that's a perfect fifth minus one point on your assignment. I didn't really understand it because like, it sounds good to me, but the more that I did it and the more that I avoided perfect fifths when I heard it, then I could be like, oh, that sounds wrong to me. There's like something in this aesthetic, this voice leading aesthetic that sounds wrong if I use perfect fifths. And so that tool basically guided my ear to understand what I was listening to on a deeper yeah. level. Like it is what it is, because it doesn't have perfect fifths. And if you include them in there, then it's a different style of music entirely. And yeah. that attention to detail with that sort of sound is kind of what's necessary in studying and studying music and what we're going for. And hopefully like what we're excited about because we all have channels where we geek out about this stuff. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I had the exact same problem because I was, I was really into Debussy, uh, mm. still am. And he does a lot of like planing, which is a lot of parallel motion and, uh, and so, yeah, I do like a Bach kind of corral sort of thing and be like, oh, this sounds really cool. And then get a D on it. And like, OK, so not supposed to write stuff that sounds cool. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to write stuff that sounds cool for somebody else. Exactly. Ah, yeah. It's a pain in the ass when it happens. It really is. Um, yeah. I mean, anytime that there's a rule in music, it's for a purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and when teachers don't tell you what that purpose is, then they're kind of a bad teacher. At least they don't. Maybe they're not a bad teacher, but they just don't know how things connect. There's a disconnect. And I think rules are great for achieving purposes. And if you have a goal, if you're, the goal is clearly outlined, we're trying to sound like this because of this. This is how you do it. Yeah. We're trying to do this. You know, um, We're trying to learn how to play over a 2 five, one. We're trying to learn how to improvise. So we're going to use chromatic approaches in these certain ways. And this is why you use it this um, in this way. Uh, I think that's important just from a from a teaching standpoint, yeah. from a pedagogical standpoint. Um, yeah, I don't know where did, where did we get off on? Oh yeah, we were just I was like, what was the original <laughs> question? <laughs> Whatever. That's something about music. Yeah, something yeah. To do with that, yeah. Hopefully. Uh, why don't you do a doctorate in? Oh, sorry. Actually, before that, uh, another super chat. Uh, as it is to pick on bass or drum. <clears throat> as it is to pick on bass or drum solos, isn't any improvisational solo in non-instrumental music self-indulgent and rarely in service of the song? I would Whoa. disagree with that. I would disagree. There's <laughs> plenty of improvisational solos that are in service of the song. I mean, as a trained vocalist, I can say that all non-vocal parts are pointless, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's basically true. Yeah. <laughs> all right, next. We're done. All right. Just... Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know, man. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that, that seems like a pretty hell of a leading question. So I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to say no. Yeah. So anyway, I would I would disagree as well. Um. OK, so the other one was, do you is it are any of you guys thinking of getting a doctorate in music like a DMA? Mm, I considered at one point going in and getting like a master's like and going back for that. But like I wanted it. That's actually sort of how I got into YouTube was I was like, I, I want to do some real world stuff first. And this seems like an easy, fun thing to do. And then that started blowing up. And I was like, I'm learning all this cool stuff on my own and researching. And I don't like I would have to put that on pause to go do an actual program because I, I this takes a lot of time to do and I like I'd do it very consistently. And I just, I don't want to do something that would require me to shut down or slow down my channel in order to, you know, theoretically in like three or four years, come back with a slightly better. Uh, I, anyway, I, and I can also like talk to theorists and like, as well, you, like, you were, you know, read uh, my own stuff and I have yeah, that background. Were, sorry to interrupt you, but okay. you were a presenter at, uh, a, at like a theory conference based yeah. on the fact that you have a YouTube channel and connected with a bunch of people, yeah. through, you know, channel. That was so <laughs> much fun, by the way. Yeah, that, that's so cool. Um, so what would like, what would even the purpose be of going yeah. down into academia when the, you know, the four of us are doing, as you said, real world stuff that seems to be connecting with so many more yeah. people than any doctorate would ever be able to get, yeah. you know, give, you know. It's, it's just it, like, it would be nice to have, but it's not, I don't think, at this point in my life, the time investment and the money investment yeah. 
aren't aren't worth it they aren't like i wouldn't get enough out of it that i can't get other ways already when um when i went and got my bachelor's uh i originally wanted to go through the whole thing like do the bachelor's masters i want to get like either a dma or a phd and i wanted to be a professor and like teach and just like look at music all day and scribe by candlelight and vellum with a quill and ink and you know i because i love that kind of stuff i thought it was really cool um but partway through my junior year nasm the national association of standardized music came through and hammered my school uh, with accreditation problems and we had to hire a new professor and my composition professor um who headed the composition studio was one of the people on the board who had to hire the new professor and the process of watching a professor get hired from the backstage was so terrifying. <laughs> I never went to grad school because it's like, <laughs> that's not going to happen. I'm not going to go that far because, wow, it was like like the candidates were so unbelievably qualified. Like a lot of them had multiple doctorates. There were like really long audition processes and like all these kinds of engagements. And it was like a, like a year and a half process. It was insane. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's just to get a teaching degree. Yeah, that's just to get a teaching position. Yeah. A teaching position. Yeah. There's something about this, which is like its own, you know, it's its own teaching position. In, yeah. In a way. I mean, it's way different, but like it at least has some of the prestige of like a university teaching position, maybe not the uh, longevity or anything else. We shall yeah. see. Where you Stability, talk. right? Uh, We're not tenure. Track YouTube channel. Yeah. We're not. Ten Can you get a tenured? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Can I get the tenure track, please? It's the professor uh, emeritus dot com. <laughs> and yet, there is something like people. Um, I've done a few videos that go into like the nitty gritty of the like. Um, you know, it's jazz improvisation and stuff like that, stuff that I learned in, in college. And, you know, there is the question of like, is it, can you get the same sorts of things from YouTube channels as you can in college? Like, because even though I am not a like professor of jazz, like for some people, there's some, you know, they get, might be able to get some of these things. I did like a video on a target tone method I called the contus firmus method, which was not like actually contus firmus, but it was like kind of this whole thing. And, you know, 8-Bit, you did the Dolphin Shoals solo, which was like a pretty good breakdown, like from the understanding of like a, uh, improvisation and like jazz, what you would learn in jazz school. Like, basically, my question is, is do you think people will be able to get a taste of a university music education just from watching our channels? I think it's different. I think partly because like if you go to a college, one of the things that you get is that you know your teachers. Like I had a private instructor and like my classes had maybe 20 people in them, usually like less, but like my teachers knew who I was. I interacted with them. I could ask them questions. And on YouTube, like there's just, I would love to be that level of accessible to all of my viewers, but that's just not practical. Course, like I just, yeah. I don't have enough hours in a day to be like a private instructor to 170,000 people roughly. Uh, it's just, it's not there. And I just, and so going to YouTube, I think you can learn a lot. And I think you can sort of self-teach yourself, self-teach yourself. You know what I mean? You can learn a lot on your own and uh, pick up a lot of things and take them and practice and do your own thing. But I don't think it's the same as, that person to person interaction that you get from a, an actual teacher. I can completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Like, like when I was in school, um, I was really kind of freaked out because there were a lot of classes that I took where it's like, why, why do I need to know about Bach? I don't care about Bach. I don't listen to his music. And you know, by the end of the semester, I'm like, Oh my God, I needed to know all of that in order to understand how all this stuff works. And I would have never pursued that on my own had I never been in a classroom where I was forced to learn it in order to advance in a degree program. And so that's, like, yeah, that's very like, true. Like as great as online, like being an auto autodidact, is that the word teaching yes. yourself? Yeah. Like as great as that is, I know for a fact that I would not ever have gotten to the position where I am now with my channel if I had tried to teach all this to myself, because at no point would I've ever been like, oh yeah, no, I need to listen to this 12 hour opera by Wagner and like understand what it does. And that's yeah. what leitmotifs are, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's 12 go. hour operas by Wagner. Yeah, well, Just... it's the ring cycle, right? It's <laughs> yeah. 
Would uh, that- yeah, yeah. Um, it's four four movements. Each one's three hours. Something like that. <laughs> it's something ridiculous. Yeah, I actually, don't know. We need to we need to have a uh, another YouTube channel that does just Wagner. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> no, Wagner put- time estimates. Just <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna put I was gonna put the ring cycle in one of my uh, videos. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say then? Like that brings up an interesting point because a lot of people watch our videos for like a taste of it. Do, are we obligated like on some sort of moral or educational level to give people some of that stuff some of the like the spinach of music theory yeah uh, cuz well i mean when you watch a video like you're getting the educational side but it's very much an entertainment based sort of thing yeah. where mm-hmm. we're cutting them up in ways that make it super visually engaging so that people watch it and the second that we're like all right now let's go down and let's go through the, all the keys in the circle of fifths. And like, let's make sure that you know all the sharps and flats of all these things. And people's eyes immediately are like, okay, great. Yeah. Um, but that's very important to be able to do that. All right, let's go and edit your uh, you know, composition homework. Let's uh, check for parallel fifths. Let's check to make sure that the voice leading is okay here. There's no like leaps of minor ninths or anything like that. Mm-hmm. That's very important. That's a big part of the process. But you're not going to get that from one of our videos. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've thought about that a lot. Like, is there yeah. some sort of obligation and you know maybe yeah, it's, it's yeah. something i thought about a lot too in terms of like and something i talked about in that academic talk i gave uh at that conference was just you know we we don't have a captive audience and so we at some level we can't be boring and we can't be repetitive and there's a lot of good studies like uh psychological studies that say that being bo- uh, being repetitive and being um challenging are the two most are two of the most important parts of learning and uh, learning mastery and understanding how to how to actually get something like i know off the top of my head that the key of e major has four sharps and i know that because i spent a long time memorizing those sorts of things yep and it's just like i can't do that in a video but I, i tend to think that part of what our job is or sort of the main point of what we do is less to sort of teach you any specific fact about music theory and more to give you an insight into how a music theorist thinks yeah. and sort of what we do. Cause like I, so I, I used to teach like voice lessons to kids. That was like my job before I decided to do YouTube full time. And like, I mean, I obviously I taught them like skills to practice. I've worked on specific songs, but I think like the most important thing that kids, those kids learned from me wasn't any of that. It was the idea that the melody matters more than the lyrics. When you're learning Mm -hmm. to sing a song, you need to know what the notes are more than you need to know what the words are. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of key to how a professional singer thinks about music, but it's not necessarily obvious if you're not that. So in the same sort of way, I think that what we do is show those sorts of things about how, you know, we think about music. And again, like I I do these videos, like understanding whatever, and I purposely title them vaguely. And a lot of people come to them thinking they're lyric analysis videos and so you get this you thing click where them, don't you, <laughs> <laughs> you click yeah. them yep oh always but uh that's how you make it but like the, <laughs> you get this yeah these people were like oh i it hadn't occurred to me that you could think about music like this it hadn't occurred to me that like what chords they're playing could matter this much or sort Absolutely. of how they're like those sorts of things and that's i think that is the real strength of what we do and not like that specific fact but those sort of showing who we are and what a music theorist is and what a music theorist does in a very personal interactive way. I mean, the thing that I've used to try and describe my channel sometimes and our, our channels really just the similar, yeah. like all similar, uh, art, we are to music what Neil deGrasse Tyson or Michio Kaku or Carl Sagan or whoever yeah, is Bill astrophysics Nye. or no, sorry. No, I, I was, I was adding Bill Nye, Bill Nye. Yeah. Bill Nye, of course. Uh, yeah, and of course, with the editing and everything, it all, always ends up feeling like a Bill Nye episode at, by the end of it. Um, <laughs> like, and that that you know, you're not learning stuff specifically. You're not learning what an astrophysicist needs to do in order to do what they do, but you're becoming aware of what it actually is and yeah. why they're excited about what they do and why they do what they do. And hopefully that inspires more people to do what they do. It's like Jurassic Park didn't teach you anything about paleontology, but it inspired <laughs> a generation of paleontologists. Uh, you know, like 
I think that's that's the value in it. And I, I'm still like a little bit conflicted by it because I do want to be able to teach people something that they have like tangible. Um, but yeah, it's it's like a back and forth because our platform YouTube is just not set up for that. Um, that's really interesting. I've never thought like that in terms of like being the Bill Nye, Bob <laughs> Ross, Steve Irwin kind of, you know, like, hey, let me show you this light motif. It'll bite. Um, <laughs> uh, Blacky. Yeah. No, I've. That's 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 a really interesting perspective. How? Because the thing about those shows is that they definitely sell education through the lens of a persona. You know, yeah. like yeah, like it's coming from this individual, and, and you can trust what the individual is saying. And to think of it that way, kind of places. Uh, perspective on the tremendous amount of responsibility that we all have. Cause I don't know about you guys, but I don't have an editor. I don't have a writer. I'm fact checking myself, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of like I if people, if, if that's what we are musically, then that's like a profound responsibility on us to make sure that we give everybody exactly like the best thing that we can, the most accurate thing we can every single time. Yeah. For sure. And also on the subject of like editor or writer, like I don't trust anybody to no. like, I mean, I mean, who would do that? Like you would need a person exactly like you, you know, anyway. Oh, there are, there are a lot of people who do that. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. I, I understand. I but just... like one of the things with visual media, that's very difficult, very difficult is getting a person who understands visual media, who also understands music on a, like a deeper level. Yep. Uh, it's yeah. very difficult. But anyway, at some point. Yeah. Um, cool. So, uh, a couple other questions. Let's see. Um, chromatic pivot modulation. Okay. What, what would you uh, like a pivot chord? Yeah. I, I, I'm just looking, sorry. I'm trying to find, oh, here's, I'm, I'm sorry. Here's a super chat. Uh, what bass tips would you give to a grad level music theorist who never picked up a bass or guitar before? What do classical musicians do wrong? That's more of a bass question. Um, so I guess I can say, uh, play with two fingers, strictly alternate your right hand and play with a relaxed left hand wrist. And what do classical musicians do wrong? Does anybody have any thoughts on what uh, they play classical? What? <laughs> I said they play classical. They but... play classical. There we go. <laughs> um, what do you think of Michael New? Do you know Michael New? Nope. I know of him. You check his older videos out. He doesn't post that much anymore, yeah. but um, very, so, very clear, concise introduction to music theory. And, you know, actually, I get that question a lot. Like, um, when you want to learn music theory from YouTube channels, like, what, what do you guys recommend for, like, intro to music theory? I mean, or I made music. a series for intro to music theory. Uh, it was on oh, my channel, just building blocks. Building blocks. Uh, we yeah, yeah. stopped doing it eventually because we got into things where it was like, this is not really building blocks. Like I was talking <laughs> about like tritone subs and I was like, you know yeah. what? I can just talk about tritone subs in a real video. It's not, that's fine. But uh, but we started like from like, what is a note? And then yeah. like, how do we notate things? What is a chord? What is a scale? Those, what what are rhythms? Like, I, I, how did we do rhythms? Uh, and I think we talked about that in the notation anyway. But yeah, the, those sorts of things, uh, and just starting from the very basic and building up. So that and that's often what I recommend is just go watch my series on bu uh, building blocks. Hell yeah, perfect. I, I forgot then, you did that, man. I'm I'm yeah. gonna start doing that because I never know exactly what to say, and I've always tried yeah. to like, should I start one? But it's just another, just yet another thing to do. <laughs> so thank plus, you. I think it also really depends on what you want to know. Like if like if you want to know like. Uh, common practice period functional tonal harmony then like yeah there's a bunch of stuff out there for it but um like i'll make a th more theory dense video so that i can cite it later on like i did a, my clock diagram yeah. video because yeah. i wanted to like talk about set theory and so now if i ever have to bring up something atonal i can break out a clock diagram and be like if you don't know what this is here's a whole video on it but this is what's going on here you know yeah yeah, that's often really helpful just to have those things in your backlog. Mm -hmm. Like recently, the video I did today, I talked about chromatic medians. And I just, I have a video on chromatic medians already. So yep. I don't have to, but yeah. There we go. Um, cool. All right, sorry. Let's do a couple other quick ones. What are y'all's favorite system of organizing triads? Uh, Whoa. Aside from Alphabetically. Alphabetically. <laughs> a, B, C, D. <laughs> So oh, the okay. a, a flat, A, A sharp, B flat, B, B sharp. How would that be? Uh, yeah. 
I, I, I'm not quite sure exactly where this question is coming from. And that would be a tone cluster. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Oh, <but laughs> keyboard. I should be playing some of these things. Um, oh, nice. I meant to bring mine, but it's heavy and I'm lazy. So, yeah, I, I just set this up so I can do. <laughs> nice. All right. The chat's about to go wild. And okay, cool. Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you do that? You gotta give people what they want. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, somebody asked, oh, here's another super chat. Do you still, do you guys still take lessons? In other words, take lessons. <laughs> no, um, no, I'd like, I, I want to still, I just, time is difficult at this point. And that's, I'd like, I, I don't want to like give the impression that like, I'm like done learning. Like, I think that that's like a really dangerous way to ever think about yourself but like I am at a point where learning, like taking a lesson is probably less useful, uh, less good use of my time than a lot of other things that I'm doing. It's just sort of, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I'm at a point where uh, I'm very, very aware of all the ways that I suck and uh, need to get better. <laughs> and so I don't need another person telling me about those. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, yeah. It's That's too true. real. <sighs> Yeah, it's something I want to do, but I just haven't done in a while. Like, it, it would also be nice to have a lesson on an, an instrument that I don't play, just to like yeah. learn how that instrument works. Like, uh, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. if I was going to do lessons, it would probably be with like someone who was an expert in some non-Western kind of theory. I think that would be like yeah. really interesting and sort of get a little bit less Eurocentrism in my education. Because like, you know, dude, I'd really like to meet somebody who could play the imbira and like teach me about it. Because that is such um, a cool little instrument. So, what is yeah. the imbira? The imbira, um, it's got a bunch of names like imbira, kalimba. I think also oh, like yeah, marimba, yeah, but it's like a little thumb piano with the metal prongs on it. It's in I think central southern Africa or something. But it's such a cool sound, and I'd really like to know like the system that goes into it and how it works. Yeah, do you do you guys know of the kora, which is kind of like yeah, a West, yeah, yeah, West African? I mean, it's kind of similar but different. Yeah. Uh, that's Lengua another instrument. That was in Black yeah. Panther. Oh, was it? No, oh, it yeah. was. That's awesome. I saw. Yeah, that um, there's a guy in the subway who plays kora and sings. And I was like, this is dude, wonderful. really? Yeah. Oh man, he <laughs> makes bank too because it's very, very impressive to see a kora player actually like go in and man, it's like, um, yeah, it'd be. It'd be awesome to like study with somebody that I have no concept of like what they're doing probably yeah. wouldn't take a bass lesson because I can yeah I know what I'm doing wrong I don't need anybody to tell me what I'm doing wrong sure um that yeah. or like shamisen shamisen would be pretty cool too <laughs> I know uh I know a couple of people have taken some shamisen lessons mm -hmm. uh westerners foreigners as they are called uh favorite augmented sixth chord Italian German or French German <laughs> Uh, what's okay? The Italians without the uh, God, it's been forever. Germans to try. The uh, Italians to try. Uh, Germans just a revoiced dominant. No, uh, seven, Germans, right? Germans is German the one without the fifth? That's the and Italian. Then Italian. Italian has, the, the Italian has no fifth. German has the fifth, and then the French has French the sharp that, four. That ray, that ray yeah. right there. But I was I was always taught that the augmented sixth chords you shouldn't be thinking along those lines. You should think of them as a collection of voices that move to another, move to the yeah. five or the yeah. It's a passing chord, yeah. right? Yeah. Um. Just, yeah, but I still think about it that way anyway. Yeah, it's so. just it's easier. It's just like they have three of the same notes. It's just what you're doing with the thing that's supposed to be the fifth. Yeah, and it's yeah, and I don't know. Uh, French is fun because it's the most interesting. But yeah, one of the things that I always found interesting about the like the unit when you learned augmented sixths or whatever, which is something that you know yeah. I never deal with anymore more was yeah. neapolitan chords seemed to be a chord a, like a quality that just stopped existing yeah. past, <laughs> past a certain point <laughs> pop music does not ever use the neapolitan chord in like traditional like voice leading you have the flat yeah. two chord yeah that's not how a neapolitan chord works it's because um, that inversion right yeah, yeah like oh i can i can demonstrate the neapolitan chord <laughs> there we go but, neapolitan wait, 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 so, if you're going to use a neapolitan chord you have to use it in a reharmonization of the lick Oh my god, uh, I can't think like that. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's not going to even work, so. There we go. Nice. That's the Neapolitan harmonization. Nice. So what it is, nice. 
like the it's the two chord in uh in first inversion sorry second inversion first inversion no it's in first inversion. first inversion yeah first flat inversion. two and first inversion so it would be like a d minor going to an e flat going to uh an a going back to one the d minor and the reason why it works is the um, way my theory professor said is that raw which is the flat two yeah. goes to t which is the natural seven goes to one and that sort of like voice leading never really happens and i always thought that that was so cool like the first yeah. time i heard that in like the chopin prelude uh whatever prelude that was i don't know chopin and just, just sort of, of like chromatic encircling chromatic encircling yeah it's just but it was so stylistic like such yeah. a, a core that was squarely in the 19th century and then just yeah. doesn't exist anymore <laughs> and yet we all learn about it because because it's it's cool it's cool yeah, <laughs> yeah sounds cool so so i got a question for you guys this is this is something like might, might be interesting maybe not what would you say was the most difficult video for you to make right not necessarily the most successful, not necessarily the one you're most proud of, but what one required like the most hours put in? Probably one I did about combination tones. Tartini really tones. Tartini tones, yeah. I love those. Just either that one or one I did about um, subharmonic music, which is, uh, does anybody know anything about anomalous low frequency vibration? Yeah. Yeah, okay. in an infrasound video. Yeah, well, it's... Yeah. It's slightly different than no. it's slightly different. It's like this whole thing that is only applicable on string instruments because of, they call it torsional vibration. Like the way that the bow hits the string causes the the string to vibrate in these very strange, weird ways that require like super computers to like calculate. Anyway, I, I spent oh, like no. a long time like trying to figure this shit out, and I I didn't yeah. ever. But yeah. like it's stuff like that where I start going deep in the weeds, where like I can't. I can't learn enough in enough time to make a video the way that I want to. So I kind of just abandoned it after a while. And then I just make the video up until the point where I learn to, yeah. um, but probably those two. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't want to interrupt, but, uh, Ian Ross, thanks for, uh, the Embira shout out. I, I know there's a lot of different <laughs> systems, but, uh, I definitely like to see a professional. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Go on. Oh, Kono. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm just reading this shout out. Uh, Konono number one. All right. Well, I'll, I have to. I have to look up Mimbira stuff because yeah, that's it's such well. a cool instrument. Sorry, twelve tone eight bit. You guys. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I, th I think partly because I stick to like a strict weekly schedule. Like they, they're just there's always this point where it's like it's a deadline and I'm done learning and I have to write the script. And so I, I'm having trouble sort of thinking of and mostly sort of like what Adam was saying, where like there's videos where I get to a point where I'm like I just. I have to stop and I haven't learned enough yet. Like I'm going to abandon this. Like I, there's one, there's, there's a couple topics I probably shouldn't say because I still want to make videos about them that I like just couldn't get in that time. So I'm sort of spending, trying to spend more time with them. But of course that goes slowly because I have to spend time with the topics that I'm doing now. So it's sort of these, these videos is a couple ideas of sort of white whales in the back of my head that are like, I want to do this and it's coming, but I haven't quite been able to take the time and also convince myself that I know enough yet. And that's yeah. part of it is just sort of getting over that like fear of being wrong and just like e even past the point where I was like, I, I know enough to make a video about this. I have to convince myself that I won't embarrass myself, you know? Well, sometimes, yeah. sometimes I've had the, the experience of like, I think I know enough about the subject and then in the process of like writing out the script and making the video, I realized how much I didn't understand. And then I learn about it. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes making the video teaches me something about it as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. Eight bit. What about you? Do you have any videos that you consider your, your most difficult? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Cause, uh, I feel like I do a lot less research per video than, uh, you guys, or at least you got, that, so. you got to transcribe it all right. Yeah, yeah, I do a lot of transcribing. That's so, like, I mean, it's work. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, like, dude, I saw I saw your Pokemon video where you broke down all the like crazy chromatic stuff. That oh, was yeah. like, I saw that and I was like, Jesus, this dude broke all this down and all four voices. <laughs> like, that was, so that was probably video. that was probably one of the most difficult in terms of time spent with YouTube on 0.5 times speed. Just like, <laughs> yeah. dee, 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 dee. okay, like, dee, dee, dee. K K K K J Yeah, yeah. <laughs> J. <laughs> yeah. but uh. Yeah, I know I had one on uh, uh, Breath of the Wild's Kakariko Village theme, which uses a lot of like traditional Japanese instruments. 
that I didn't know anything about. And so that one took a lot more research, just figuring out like what these are all called and how they work. And and I'm sure I got all of it wrong, but. Uh, <laughs> no, that feeling. Well, yeah, I mean, it's for me, I've, I've been considering for a long time, like going to a monthly schedule just so I could do like longer videos because I, I recently did a video it was about 20 minutes long like what does music mean and it was just uh, even then I had to abandon like a lot of the ideas I was go trying to go down because a lot of the times when I do a video I kind of like want it to be like the definitive video on that subject <laughs> and yeah. as of like a purely like um like <laughs> egotistical sort of thing like no it has to be mine has to be the thing when it comes <laughs> to the top but you know there's only so many hours to like dedicate and of course you're going to be wrong at some point but uh, mm -hmm. i think that's a big yeah. big part of it is you know knowing when to quit <laughs> every time i hit that upload button i immediately think of like two or three things i wish i added to the video oh yeah like, every, every time. single time without every fail time. It's, the worst is when you cut something out of the video in the editing phase and then you get a bunch of comments like oh why didn't you talk about this every yeah time. because time i only have so many hours yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like I always uh, get that with with the analyses where like I like there's always more to talk about in terms of like especially like in specific songs like th there's always something they did that you don't have room for and like in the Hotel California one I just did like I uploaded the video and I was like you know what I should have mentioned how not resolving the secondary dominance fits with the disorienting lost feel of the song and I like I was like really really mad at myself for not saying that but of course if I'd said that there would be something else I'd be mad at myself for it's just is always you can always go deeper on those sorts of things so one, oh sorry no no no, no i was just agreeing okay uh, yeah one one thing that I, I think about a lot with the videos is like structuring how you deliver like um and maybe this is part of like the youtube language but how you deliver certain ideas like um you i almost like think of it as like a telling a story like you have to hit certain points at, in a certain way at in a certain cadence maybe this is coming into like the whole edutainment side of things but yeah. like um i delete a lot of things from my videos simply just because it doesn't fit the cadence with how i want to structure the thing um like i definitely like um there's a moment in a lot of vsauce videos and i get compared to vsauce a lot yeah. i'm sure you guys have had this sort of thing happen too but oh, yeah. like been called the minute physics of music more times than i can count oh nice that's a good that's a good one though i like Happy that about it <laughs> yeah um but like there, there's a moment in a lot of those videos where he like jumps up from the side and just says, or is it? And I think of that idea of like, you know, <laughs> setting up an expectation and then um, like subverting it is like a powerful way of like keeping a person hooked into like a story of like how you're understanding these subjects. But even, even still like it's, it, I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts of like cadence and like how you approach structuring your actual like scripts and like uh, how you guys write your, write your videos? Oh, definitely. It's, uh, yeah, you, you know, you try and, and like we are educate or not education. We're, uh, entertainment first, I think, yeah. which yeah. is a weird position to be in. And like, yeah. strange, <laughs> very strange, like but hopefully yeah. smart entertainment, but yeah. well, and it's interesting too, cause it kind of like what we were talking about before, um, we're, you know, I don't know if I'd say we have a, a duty to educate people with the spinach of music theory or whatever, but we definitely like, there's going to be a large uh, portion of all of our audiences that just enjoys the video for entertainment and then goes about the day, you know? So like you kind of do have to think about that primarily. And I, I've been trying to think about that more and more the longer I've been uh, doing this of just like structuring things in a way where, there is almost a narrative to it, even if I'm just analyzing a song or a soundtrack or whatever. Yeah, that's sort of a uh, reminds me of some advice I got from Emily Grassley, uh, which was basically like, write your video like it's the greatest story you've ever told. Like, mm -hmm. don't don't try and just build it as a piece of information. Think like think like introduction and then body and then like conclusion. And that's sort of a thing that I've sort of really been working on recently is conclusions and just like ending a video in a way that feels like it wraps up instead of just ends. Because, you know, with, with facts, with like a lesson, you know, you just like, this is, these are the things, here's the things, go do your homework. And then it's sort of wrapping it up and coming back to like, here is what this means and here's why you care and here's why it's connected is I think a really important part of 
how to do these things correctly. And it's a thing I don't think I'm that great at, but it's a thing that I've been working on. Yeah, I think the uh, outlining why anyone would care about this is like what separates the music theory YouTuber yeah. uh, scene from yeah. the actual just education scene, you know? Yeah, I think that's a, a big part with intros too, is just like starting well, the thing that like, when I started, I was just like, I'm just like, hey, today we're talking about chromatic medians. And that is this. And that is not a good way to start your videos. It's just... <laughs> It's just not because no one knows that they care about the thing. So starting with, and when I did my video on chromatic recent uh, media medians, wow, I can talk. Uh, but it's sort of what I did was I started by playing a hexatonic pole, or I tried to. I actually screwed up the MIDI recording. But anyway, <laughs> it, I said it was a hexatonic pole, and mistakes happen. But that was sort of my goal was just like, here's a really cool thing that you don't understand yet. Mm -hmm. Let me show you why it matters, because then I can go into let's talk about what normal medians are, where if I'm like, let me tell you about the three chord and the six chord. A lot of people are going to be like, nope, done. This is this is boring. This is pointless. I know this. So, yeah, yeah. Starting, yeah. start with why you care. Like, I think one of the things about talking about film that kind of really helps me with that is like, I can be like, hey, guys, this is Pixar. People are already like, oh, well, I've seen a couple of Pixar movies. I like that. And what I try and do is... I kind of think about it the same way you might do like a sonata where you introduce an idea, you break it down into pieces. And then when it comes back, it's different, right? Like the, the three sections. So yeah. like I'll introduce people. It's like, Hey, this is the film. This is really cool. It does this thing. Let me show you how it works. And then when I bring it back at the end, it's like, here's this thing that you now have a new perspective on and how it's directly applied to what it is that we were talking about in the beginning. And so I always try and think of like, I want people to come into my video with one perspective and out of my video with a different perspective. You know? Yeah. The, the way I've described it is you have to think musically in the composition of a video. You have to think sure. of, you know, music without form doesn't have the same impact as music that has had form, you know, super, mm -hmm. super well yeah. thought of. Um, yeah. One of the most interesting things that ever happened, like with uh, interaction, like have you guys, um, I guess you guys don't generally have, I mean, this is like another element, which is very weird to me, but because I'm normally talking head in the videos, like people will sometimes recognize me. And there was a kid that like came up to me and said like, hey, I was having like a discussion with my friend and he said that perfect fourths are consonant, but you said on your video that perfect fourths are dissonant. So I argued with him about that. And there was an interesting moment during that where I was like, yeah, in certain cultural contexts, like in certain situations, perfect fourths are treated like dissonance and composers are thinking of a perfect fourth in a certain way. And these are the reasons why that might be. But there's a there's a certain like almost disconnect between how the kid was understanding what my videos were yeah. saying and what like the necessary understanding in order to actually, you know, get behind why a perfect fourth might be dissonant in certain situations. And that like really struck a chord with me, um, no pun intended, or maybe... <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a pun. Um, just because what we do actually has an impact, and it's hard to even understand that when you're like interacting with a camera or like interacting with yeah. a, a computer screen all day. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Like in terms of like the impact you feel like your videos have had, um, or like any experience with people like who so, have, have said that. Um, in one of my videos. I talked about um, what, like how Disney uses language. And one of the things that I drew a lot of attention to is a Bulgarian women's choir. Hell yeah. And uh, I thought it was like, I remember hearing about it in college and I thought it sounded really cool. And I know all these, like I, w I literally walked out of Moana going like the fact that they used a non-English language is bitching. This is crazy cool. This is awesome. Someone home made the video. Um, I, I just saw Solo. And I'm not going to spoil anything. Um, la, la, la. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil anything because I love Star Wars, so I don't spoil anything. But there is a part, like uh, even a leitmotif, where I swear to God, I heard a Bulgarian women's choir. And I turned to my girlfriend and I was like, Sarah, is, is that a Bulgarian women's choir? And she was like, yeah, I, I think it is. I went home and someone tweeted at me and I was like, hey, there's a Bulgarian women's choir in this. Why? And I like I was sitting in the movie theater, kind of having this moment. Like, did somebody seem like I haven't heard anybody talking about this? I don't know if he's got some sort of connection to it, but it was like, 
dude, did like one of your assistants watch a video and they were like, oh, I want this to sound kind of foreign. And they were like, you know, you could use a Bulgarian women's choir. And like, that's how it happened. And it's, it's kind of like kept me up at night. Like, did I make a video that affected the outcome of a Hollywood film or am I just being like the biggest narcissist right now? <laughs> Right, because it's like you made a YouTube video, dude. Like, let's calm down before it's like, hey, let's talk about Star Wars. I know, and maybe it was one of your guys' videos, honestly. But I know, maybe it was Bulgarian. I don't know, but I, I'd heard like you know, on the um, Ghost in the Shell, they used Bulgarian women's. Yeah, choir. that was my video. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there we go. It was your your video. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe maybe because that's such a cool sound. Um, uh, that's that's really cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and it still bothers me. Like I, I need, I need to know. It's like, listen, <laughs> for for the sake of my sleep, I need to know if I'm just super egotistical or if like one of your kids had my video on in the background. Like, what what's going on here? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's nice to feel like what you are doing is having an impact. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's it's cool. It's something that I'm not not sure if I how I feel just as Adam Neely, the human being, because I'm normally not. I don't like to be the center of attention, but I do like to be uh, excited about. It, so that is cool. Yeah. Um, well, guys, thank you so much for, I think this is now, I think we've been doing this for about an hour and a half. Uh, I think, uh, and I know we could probably do it for another hour and a half, but oh, I, certainly. yeah, we could just do this. Maybe we'll do it again. That would be really fun. Yeah, we do. Uh, Musica oh, yeah. Analytica. That's the name yeah. of this live stream. What does Analytica mean? I, I just I, it's, it's like sounds Cambridge cool. Analytica. Sounds <laughs> sounds like yeah, analysis, but it's Latin. Yeah, right, cool. Ish. I don't, so, I don't think it's the actual Latin word. But <laughs> type. Like, oh, because so, like, because somebody on my Twitter was like, "Hey, Twitter, when the search bar when you type it in, it doesn't come out as Analytica." Like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we might have to figure out what it actually means. <laughs> yeah. Uh, minor detail just you know we were talking about like making sure everything was super well researched and then just came up with this idea of like oh yeah that's fine uh, <laughs> hang out well, we're musicians we're not latin teachers yeah seriously anytime i do any math we should do, it. We should do like music analysis <laughs> but every time we do a live stream it'll be in a different language <laughs> that'll be uh, fun bonsoir je m'appelle adam <laughs> hola uh, um all right so thank you so much guys for <laughs> watching uh, this is Musica and Elitica out. Peace. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye.